Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. If you have questions or trouble with fitting a bolster or guard to a hidden tang knife, this video is for you. If you're like me, you probably struggled with fitting a guard or bolster to a hidden tang knife and are not entirely satisfied with the results you may have gotten at different points in time and want to do better at it. So I'm going to walk you through how I do this now, currently. And yes, it could change in the future as I continue to learn. So fitting a guard or a bolster really starts very early on in the knife build because everything you're doing with the tang here is going to affect how you fit that guard or bolster in the future. We've got a couple, several blades here that are hand sanded and finished on the bevels, are ready for an edge, and there's nothing else we're going to do to the actual blade. We actually just need to go ahead and fit the guard or bolster and then put a handle on this. Something you need to take into consideration before grinding away material or even forging a blade is the at least the general design features of, of the knife. These are working blades. These are designed for use, a general purpose belt knife. And as such, the Ricasso is approximately the same width as the blade. I don't have a nice, I don't have a, a large drop down to the edge like a lot of these buoys that you see these days. There's nothing wrong with that, but this is a more practical and actually usable blade design for a variety of different things. And so, hence the design. What I'm going to do here, and there's different ways of doing this, but I'm going to align the guard or the bolster with the plunge line. And again, that's something that uh, really does play into this as well. Separate subject, but having your plunge lines even and the same on each side is going to be important to an overall good finished product and it's going to play into how you fit the guard. Now in some cases you might be able to work off of everything simply being 90 degrees to the spine, but if you've got a swoop to the spine or any kind of ergonomical curves to it, that might be a little bit difficult to do. You're kind of working out of a non-definite point at that, at that stage, if that makes sense. And so that is a little bit the case here because I've got a little bit of a upturn to the blade. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to simply move back about three eighths of an inch here, whatever this thickness of this particular piece of steel is, line it up with the uh, plunge line and give myself a reference mark back on the Ricasso. I could go back further on the Ricasso here, about a half inch, and create the shoulders at that point, giving myself more of a Ricasso. Talking about Ricassos is a whole subject by itself. Uh, the utility or lack of utility of a Ricasso is a subject of debate, and it really just depends on the personal preference of the bladesmith or the user, even more importantly. Personally, I tend to prefer a minimal to no Ricasso on a using blade for various reasons, one of those being that having a large Ricasso, a, a lengthy Ricasso, pulls the usable edge further away from the hand of the user, which actually creates an adverse leverage against the user, and that doesn't really help anything when you're trying to cut through a piece of of material of any kind that that's works in opposition to you. So in this case, I'm going to opt for that shorter Ricasso length and it's still going to leave some Ricasso there and that forged finish. It's going to look pretty nice like that, I think. So this uh, tool right here is invaluable. It's a file guide with carbide inserts. There's any number of different uh, makers of these tools. You could even make it yourself. I would recommend getting one with carbide inserts. They are more expensive, but they are better for what they're used for. That carbide is not going to get worn away by a file or even, as you'll see, a grinding belt on, on your grinder. And this is going to be very important in the next stage here. So with the, with the carbide inserts facing the tang, I'm going to move it up to that shorter Ricasso indexing there and, and tighten the screws down. If I wanted to make this more of a 90 degree to this blade, 
I need, would need to grind my plunge lines appropriately at the beginning, which as you can see, they are not. And so that's not a design feature of this particular blade. And so like I said before, the prep that you do prior to actually starting the fitting of a guard or a bolster is just as important and you kind of need to have a plan for how you're going to go forward with that. We can go to the belt grinder now and I'll show you the next step. All right, before we get into it, let me show you the setup I have here on the belt grinders for doing this job. And I'm doing multiple blades here, obviously, so having redundant equipment is super helpful. First belt grinder here, we've got the flat platen, of course, with the glass backer on there and an 80 grit ceramic belt. And that's a, like a, I think it's a Y weight, which is real heavy, heavier than an X even, I believe. Over here on the second belt grinder, same platen setup with the with the glass this one's a little bit chipped right there so this edge is better than that edge but anyway we've got a 220 grit aluminum oxide belt it's a uh, j flex a j weight so it's pretty soft and flexible and it's been used a little bit that doesn't matter it's got enough abrasive on it to do what we need to do here so these are the two grinder setups that we're going to be using and We'll start on this one. Okay, pull off the uh, personal air purifying respirator hood here for a second so I can show you and make sure that it's clear what we've done up to this point. So, so far I've only roughed in the shoulders with the 80 grit belt, stayed away from the carbide inserts a little bit. It doesn't really grind it, the carbide, but I just wanna prolong the life of, the, of that carbide as long as possible for this tool. And it's important to pay attention to the size of the shoulders. You want them to be equal, except in a case where you might not, but I don't know what that would be exactly. In this case, obviously we're going for pretty much equal shoulders and I'm just eyeballing that, but, and I want it to be really close. Next, we have gone and thinned down the actual thickness of the tang from the shoulders. And so we have very faint but still present shoulders at the thickness of the tang as well as the width which is very obvious there this is going to aid in the fit up of the guard you'll notice here that i was holding on to the end of the tang and we haven't ground completely through here that's because on the final fit up of this blade the tang is going to come to about here i mean that's almost the full length of the grip and it's going to be at least three quarters of the length of the handle so i don't need this little bit right here but it is handy to hold on to while you're grinding it i can just cut or just grind that off 
and then just make sure that there's a nice taper all the way down. It doesn't have to be exaggerated, but it does need to be thinner here than it is here, or you will obviously run into problems when fitting the guard. So let's go to the next grinder and finish out the process that we started. Okay, right off the grinder here, blew off the uh, dust with the compressor, show you what we have going on. So you can see that I got my shoulders uh, the equal, they're not quite equal, uh, this one's a little bit smaller. So, you know, pay attention to that. But you can see what we have here, get something of a pointer right here. That's not much of a pointer, hold on. So we've got a nice radius right in here and that radius follows around so that you have a radius at this corner as well. So hopefully you can see that in the camera. This is radiused here, and then it follows all the way around to here, and we've got a little bit of a radius there. So all the way around, we don't have any sharp 90 degree uh, corners, especially here and here. The shoulders are flush with the carbide inserts here. And I don't know if you can see that on that plane in the camera there, hopefully. But there is maybe just a tiny bit right here, but they are almost completely flush. I might need to take that one down now. No, I think it's right there with the, uh, with the carbide inserts and so they're on the same plane and they are flat and clean very close and we've got a taper to the tang here up until this point we're going to address that once we remove the file guide and i think we can do that now i might run this back and just make sure because i can see just the slightest edge in the light here not an edge per se but a maybe like a couple thousandths or just a thousandths right there. I'll be right back. All right, let's take off the file guide and see what we have here. All right. Looking pretty good. Got a little bit of a shoulder there, just ever so slightly. Everything is crisp. All right, let's finish addressing this.
Okay, so our tang is fully prepped to begin actually fitting the guard. That's all we've done so far is prep the tang, and trust me when I say it is just as important as anything you're gonna do with the actual guard material from here on out. So we've still got a nice length to the tang. Like I said, it's almost the full length of the grip, which is more than acceptable for a knife of this size and design. The thickness of material that we have at the tang is more than adequate. And I wanna address something right now. You might be wondering or asking, why am I not using a file on this file guide to do this work and fit, you know, prep this tang for fitting the guard? A couple reasons. First of all, this blade is fully hardened and tempered, so fully heat treated throughout the full length of the tang. Different people heat treat their blades differently. Some will do just an edge quench or an edge heat treatment and leave the rest of it soft and thereby facilitating to some extent the ability to use a file on this kind of work. That would still be difficult with this particular steel being 50 to 100 because even at a cooling and still air, it's going to have enough resistance to the file because of the carbide content in the steel, in the pearlitic stage even, to make that rather difficult and a pain in the neck. So that's the first thing. Secondly, why don't I heat treat my blades in that manner and make the tang and the spine softer? Well, there's two different, or a couple different ways you could do that. You could just quench the, uh, the edge and leave the rest of it in a pearlitic state. Or you could quench the entire thing like I've done here and then come back and soften the tang and the spine. I don't do either of those because in this state, this tang is more than tough enough to handle what this knife is for and the blade of this would probably break before the tang did. And if that happened, then this knife has been severely abused and misused. So. That's really not in a concern of mine. When I heat treat my blades, I'm going for a very tough, combination of toughness and edge retention. So get a nice fine grain for the toughness, which is important not just for the overall strength of the blade or the knife, but the actual strength at the edge. Because one of the ways that a blade dulls is through microchipping, which means the edge is not tough. That is a completely different subject. Hold on, don't let me get started on metallurgy and heat treatment. The point I'm trying to make here is that this steel is too hard to use a file on this. And even if we heat treated it so that the tang was softer than the edge or even the blade, it would still be troublesome with this particular steel. My goal here as a professional bladesmith, meaning I pay the bills doing this, is to make a high quality, high functioning, heirloom quality knife in a reasonable amount of time so that I can actually pay my bills. There's nothing wrong with taking months to complete a knife if you're doing it as a hobby and your livelihood doesn't depend on it, or perhaps you're creating a high level of artwork that you have built a market to uh, sell that to but that's not what I'm doing here. I'm making heirloom quality working blades that are high functioning and I need, need to be able to do that in a somewhat reasonable amount of time in order to do what I'm doing and provide for my family. So all those reasons put together is why I've done everything like this to this point. I guess the easiest way to sum this all up is to say that my methods that I have developed here or adopted, I'm sure I'm not the first one to do it this way, are to achieve a high level of fit and finish on a very practical basis. So let's continue. The bolster or guard material that I'm going to be using on these knives is just a nice old good old traditional brass. A word about that, not all brass is created equal. This is 360 brass stock from JantSupplyKnifeMaking.com. They're not a sponsor but I've been purchasing from them for years and it's a good place to get a lot of stuff including this. You can go onto Amazon and find some cheaper brass stock from various places, and I will say it's not all created equal. This particular brass is malleable and workable. I've had other brass that is brittle, and even despite a softening process in which you heat it up to a red hot and quench it in water, quite the opposite of steel, it still did not soften. So I really don't know what kind of alloy 
they are putting in that and what is up with that. But this stuff is good and that's what we're gonna be using today. Not getting too fussy at this point, I just need enough material to give myself leeway on either side of the width of my ricasso. And if you are gonna do a finger guard, you're gonna need some extra. So I'm just gonna eyeball it and give myself about half an inch extra material aside from the leeway on the width of my ricasso and just cut it off. I've deburred this heavily on each end on the grinder so that it will lay flat and you don't catch your finger on any of the burrs that can be a little uncomfortable. This is one inch wide by three sixteenths inch thick. First thing I'm gonna do, not that, hold on a second, is get my blade here. And again, I'm just gonna eyeball where I want it to go. So leaving more material down that away for a little bit of a finger guard, nothing too exaggerated in this particular case here and a little bit of leeway up here. I'm gonna mark the widest point of my tang. Okay, just some, uh, some little marks right there. Next thing I'm gonna do is take my calipers. Yes, I know you're not supposed to use them as a scribe, but be honest, we all do. Get a cheap pair. This is kind of my uh, beater pair of calipers, and I'm going to scratch a center line in between those two little marks that I just made, I don't want to go beyond those because then I'm going to have to sand those scratches out. And why do any more sanding than you have to? So we're just going to stay between the two marks. Uh, yeah, not like that. That's what you don't do right there. Okay, so hopefully you can see that right there. Maybe get it in the light here. See if I can uh, get the camera to show that to you here. We've got a couple of, there we go, a couple little marks right here, and then a mark here and a mark here, and this is approximately where the slot for the tang is gonna go. All right, next you need to be aware of the thickness of the thickest part of the tang where this guard is actually gonna fit up to. And what do we have here? We've got about 178 thousandths, and it should be the same on each side, but if it's not, it's really not the end of the world, 175, 174, so we're off about 4,000 soft. Now I could go back and correct that. That's something, honestly, if I was really worried about that, I would need to check before I took the file guide off, but I'm not super worried about that. Some guys are gonna be, but really that's not gonna affect the finished product at all. That means I can use a 530 seconds drill bit to rough drill the slot here because the 530 seconds is what, 156 thousandths, somewhere in that neighborhood. And so that gives us, I don't know, almost 20 thousandths of leeway. Okay, unless you're super confident with where that drill bit is gonna go when you put this up on the drill press or even hand drill it, I would recommend doing some center punches to really guide that drill bit. Now again, Keeping in mind the width of my drill bit, I want to stay away from the finished width of the slot. So I've got three three spots punched in here. That's not going to take out all of it, all the all of the material, but it's going to be enough to start with here. This is actually a homemade scribe, so it's great for fine work. But I think I'm going to re-center punch these with an actual center punch. So of course they all should be in a nice line lined up with each other. They're pretty close there. So let's go to the drill press. Okay, over the drill press, you wanna make sure that the table on your drill press is flat, true to the spindle or the drill and the drill so that the holes you're drilling are, you know, at right angles with the piece of material. You know, having them a little bit off is not going to be the end of the world, but again, it's better to do everything as close to perfect or correct as possible as you go, and there's less of a mistake or less of a buildup of issues to correct later on. So typically what I do is I just put it flat on the table and hold it with a pair of channel locks, which, you know, works fine. I remember that I actually have a drill press vise, and so I use some extra pieces of stock for some parallels to make sure that this is sitting in the vise level and we can go ahead and drill 
I guess those will just stay in there maybe. Drill the uh, drill the holes. Not too bad. So at this stage we are still a good 16th or more of an inch away from our final dimensions on each end. And you can go straight to a chainsaw file, like an eighth inch chainsaw file, and start hogging this material out. I use a rotary tool with a carbide burr for expediency. So I don't have to sit there and do as much filing. So let's do that next. All right, quick and to the point, we've hogged out that material, and so the slot has formed, and now it needs to be fitted. You gotta be careful with those carbide burrs on that rotary tool. They can walk off on you and dig in and create a divot that is gonna be difficult to work with, so just a word of caution in that respect. So you can see how far the tang will actually fit into there at this point, not very far, which is good because we wanna be able to carefully remove more material so that it fits nice and snug up to about within 3 16 of an inch of the shoulders. But the very next thing that I do at this point is I will index and mark the guard so that I can index it again into the same location or same orientation each time. This is going to be the front. I always mark it on the front as if you're holding the knife left top left corner of the guard or bolster that's going to be ground away since this is going to be rounded off of course but that tells me where it's supposed to go and how this blade is supposed to fit in there each and every time so i don't accidentally swap it around and start working on it that way and then realize i did it the wrong direction and have it not fit now again because i've taken the material off in the wrong spot definitely don't want that even if I'm not taking the bolster in and out of the vise, it, this indexing mark tells me which way this blade is supposed to fit in the bolster when I'm checking it during filing. My favorite hand tool for fitting guards lately has been nothing more than an eighth inch Nicholson chainsaw file. You can also get yourself like a 532nds, but I'm gonna show you how I use this almost completely by itself to shape and fit the slot for this guard. So we've got some high spots in between the holes that we drilled here. And typically you'd come in with a flat file and file those flat, but I'm just gonna use the chainsaw file and run it lengthwise here and hit those high spots and give myself a nice flat surface here. I'm not saying this is the best way to do it, or the only way to do it by any stretch. I'm just saying that this is something I've been doing lately that's working pretty good in accomplishing what I need accomplished here. And it's kind of handy to be able to do it with one tool. Try to get you in here from my vantage point, so you can see right in there, it's looking pretty flat. And we're just kind of running diagonally there and knocking off those high spots. So we'll pull this out real quick and uh, have a look at the slot. So making some progress there. And you notice we're a little further up on the tang now. So I can start looking at the bolster in relation to the tang and see where the high spots are and address those specifically and I can do that without even taking it out of the vise but it's kind of hard to show it on camera. Hopefully you were able to see that there's some high spots there and whoops my files backwards I'm gonna go ahead and knock those down and I can get a little more precise and 
address one little spot here as you can see right there so pretty uh, pretty clean flat sides already and we're removing material slowly little by little and uh, sneaking that bolster a little closer to the shoulder so we're going to look at the uh, the right angles here and you don't want it cockeyed off to one side or the other and the way you file that slot is going to influence that so that's something else to pay attention to as you move up the tang okay so i've removed a little more material and you can see that we've moved up the tang a little more and now we're starting to run into the ends of our slot where the slot is still narrower than the tang hopefully that's in focus so i need to come right down here and give myself a little more of a corner on this slot and again using my eighth inch chainsaw file so even though i have the corners rounded on my tang it's really more of a rectangle than it is an oval but the radiuses are pretty similar to the size of this chainsaw file so i'm literally going to come in there and address that corner and kind of file laterally both directions to knock that out a little bit you see me moving side to side on the slot there addressing those corners Let's see where we're at. All right, so we've got a profile that looks like it's gonna fit a little better once we get a little closer up there. We still need to take a little bit more down here on the bottom and on the overall width. Okay, I'm about 7 16 away from my shoulders here. And if you look here, we're pretty close, but I did go a little bit over right here. I've got a little more room here than I should. So I might normally file up and get things a little bit closer, but I'm going to leave it there for right now because when we tap this down, it's going to stretch things out a little bit and hopefully take care of that little bit extra room we have. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and address the finish on the front of our guard. Okay, next stage here, I've got the blade wiped down with WD-40 so that the fingerprints do not create nasty marks on the blade. And then wrapped up with some duct tape to protect the finish that we worked so oh so hard on earlier. And we're ready to start fitting this guard in the final steps. I've got a piece of hardened and tempered steel here, just a scrap piece of blade steel with a sanded finish on one side that slides up to there and it will fit the full length of the tang and then I can use it as a strike plate to tap the guard down on there with my ghetto pipe driver here and not mar up the back of the guard so much and or bend it since it is malleable. And last but not least, my trusty, oh where did it go, piece of leather, no I gotta find that, that I simply used to clamp the blade in the vise. Okay, we've got our setup put together here. This shouldn't take a lot of force to fit down onto the shoulders because we've got it close and this is a malleable material. Obviously, depending on what you use, that's gonna vary a little bit. But in any case, you do want to have this nice and tight in the vise so that there's not movement of the blade if, if at all possible. You don't want to force it as long as it's moving. That's good. Okay, there it sits. This is where you're going to want to start slowing down. I'm going to pull it out of the vise here to show you what we have going on. And we're real close, but you can see where we're going to start especially right here at the bottom, it's already happened. We're gonna start hitting up against 
the very radius of the shoulder right there. Hopefully you can see that. That's going to be kind of a case-by-case -case basis, but we do need to pull this off now and address that. So you can see where we're starting to get a little bit of a wrinkle there. Actually at both ends, that's showing us where we need to start taking a little bit out there. Now we haven't even touched it down on the shoulders yet, but things are coming along nicely. We just need to do a little bit of relief there. Okay, so we've got that addressed. This should be the final, final deal here, right? Hopefully. Trying to put even pressure all the way around as we uh, work our way down. We're gonna need a little more, a little more relief. But we're coming along nicely, pretty nicely. Still got a little gap right here at each shoulder, so we need to keep going down a little bit more. So we're going to see what we need to take out to facilitate that here. Couple things to watch out for on the front finished surface here. Had a few little wrinkles along the uh, edge here, so I just addressed that on the sandpaper and smoothed that out, just pushing a little bit more material than you want to on the uh, final fit up there, and that's kind of what causes that, I think. And then likewise on the back here, if you're actually hanging up or hitting on the back side of the of the uh, brass here, that had that kind of mushroomed up on me a little bit there, and so I addressed that on some 80 grit sandpaper and relieved that just a little bit. Got to pay attention to that, and we are very very close. I need to tap it down a little bit more. So at this point, this being a malleable material, we can actually make an impression of the shoulders in our brass at each side. You can see here that we're about there. We've got a little bit more to do on the bottom shoulder here. Okay, and last but not least, you wanna be paying attention to the angles here, making sure that this is at right angles to your ricasso as you're sending that home in the final stages here. And I'm just using this uh, scribing tool, this block here, to kind of show, well, this tape's in the way, but um, we're, we're pretty good here. We've got some nice right angles, and that's what you want. And again, this is uh, something you can tweak as needed a little bit uh, back and forth to get that fit to where it's square. Final touch up on the sandpaper on the granite block to get rid of the littlest bit of wrinkly look here along that line. And you can see we've got a really nice fit up here, um, almost completely imperceptible line there. Maybe just a tiny bit on this side and uh, overall, pretty good. All right, guys, that about wraps it up, but I have two more bonus tips for you. The first one being, you'll notice that we haven't done any shaping to the guard as of yet. The reason for that is because you wanna be able to shape the shape of your guard to where it actually sits from the Ricasso because that's what it's going to be indexed off of. And you can do that with some different templates. I'll show you that real quick. And I'll show you a little tip to help with any little goof ups you might have 
Maybe you overfiled a little bit, had a little more room in this than you needed, and you need to close that gap up for a nice, tight fit like we have here. This is a guard template for a larger knife, but you can see how you use it. You index it right at the ricasso on each corner and then trace around it. This is going to give you equal quadrants all the way around indexed off of the actual knife where it should be. Now obviously this particular this particular uh, pattern or template is for a double guard and so I'm just using this for demonstration purposes. Two different templates would be necessary to actually use on this one since the bottom half of the guard, the bottom end of the guard is longer than the top. This is one way to get a very precise and clean guard shape based off of the actual knife that it's on. All right, final tip before we wrap this up, let's say that you've got some gaps showing on one or both sides of your slot because you overfiled or something along those lines. Take that guard off of there. And this is more specifically with malleable material, which is one reason why using brass like this is nice. Come over to your anvil, hold it edgewise, and just tap down, squish that slot together a little bit, and then go right back to fitting it with a little bit of tapping pressure like we did at the end there. Remember, if there is anything, any leeway gonna happen, it's underneath where these shoulders are, where you're not gonna see it and it's not going to affect anything anyway. So that's one way that you can address tiny gaps on either side of the slot. And you will probably have to readdress the finish on the flat surface with your sandpaper, but that can be pretty helpful in fixing some minor issues in that regard. All right guys, I hope you enjoyed this video and hopefully learned something from it or benefited from it in some way in your shop. You now have everything that I have and know and have tried and tested in my shop when it comes to getting a high level of fit and finish in a practical manner on fitting a guard or bolster like the one we did today. There's gonna to be some different nuances with different projects but you've got the gist of it and the base of knowledge. So I don't ask this on every video, but if you want to support the channel, you can do so for free simply by liking, subscribing, hitting that notifications bell, leave a comment, and even share this video to some of your knife maker, bladesmithing friends. As always, I appreciate you guys watching, and we will see you on the next video.